Hello everyone, welcome to Tech Talk session number 11. Uh, so we're 11 Tech Talk sessions in. So today we're talking about something very important, harmonic filter reactors. It's a pretty exciting topic. Uh, when you think about uh, harmonic filters, uh, realize that there's not many components in there. You got reactors, capacitors, resistors, switching devices, protection and control. So uh, harmonic filter reactors is probably one of the most important things to think about when getting into harmonic filter design. So we're going to get on with the presentation now. And uh, let's get going here. So let's do some harmonic filter basics first and uh, talk about, well, what is a harmonic filter? We've got some other presentations and we're going to be talking about harmonic filters in the future. Uh, but let's uh, just talk about uh, what's, what a harmonic filter does in the first place. So a harmonic filter consists of a capacitor and a reactor, the most basic notch harmonic filter system. Uh, but there's also sometimes a high pass resistor here. So remember we said resistor, capacitor, reactor. So today we're talking about what's shaded in yellow, the actual reactor. And uh, in some cases this might be iron core or air core. Iron core, remember, is used in metal closed systems air core used in open air systems and we're going to get more into that in a moment. When you have a capacitor bank, remember it causes resonance in the system and one of the key reasons you add uh, a reactor to a capacitor bank is to tune it. Okay, you want to tune it to a certain frequency. In this case you can see down here on the lower left uh, plot the impedance scan. Basically we're looking at the driving point impedance as we see it from this harmonic producing device and uh, you can see that we're tuned at a very um, at the, about the 4.7th harmonic here and we have a resonance here. So all capacitor banks create resonances, even harmonic filters do, but harmonic filters control, control the resonant point and that's what we're doing with a harmonic filter. We're controlling the resonant point, this location here and as well as this location here. Um, so when we go to the next screen, you can see that we zoomed in to the, um, to the harmonic impedance plot and what you see here is the impedance curve for the harmonic filter. Basically we're looking at the impedance down into the capacitor bank uh, which includes the reactor in the capacitor versus the impedance of the source which is a straight line. So we have a straight line inductance here which represents the source impedance and then we have the harmonic filter impedance here. So remember that when you install a filter on a system the filter will take harmonic current from the source based upon an impedance voltage divider between an impedance current divider, sorry, impedance current divider between the source and transform impedance here and the um, filter impedance here. Uh, so down here at the fifth harmonic, you can see there is a sharing of impedance between the harmonic filter, which has an impedance of, um, of maybe five ohms here. And then you can look at the impedance of the straight line at seven ohms. Uh, so there will definitely be some harmonic current that flows into the source and some that flows into the filter here. This capacitor bank is primarily capacitive, okay, primarily capacitive. It's a harmonic filter, but it's primarily capacitive at, at the fundamental frequency, 50 or 60 hertz. And the majority of the voltage drop is across the capacitor, not across the reactor. Uh, so it's important to realize that a harmonic filter bank corrects power factor number one. It puts out reactive power and the majority of the, uh, of the voltage dropped across the capacitor means it's acting capacitive, that, that network. It's not until you get above the tuning point that the, in, that the filter starts to become an inductive circuit. The amount of harmonic current that flows through that reactor is strictly dependent upon an impedance divider and how much, how much, uh, how much current you have here. So whatever harmonic current source we have, we get a division of current flow between the filter bank and the source. This harmonic filter reactor will take in whatever amount of harmonic current you feed it based upon the current divider here. And this is the key, realizing that harmonic filters are like Labrador retrievers. They just continue to eat until they are finished or until they get sick. And in the case of a harmonic filter reactor, until it fails or overheats number one cause of harmonic filter failures is overheating due to, due to excessive harmonic currents or due to a under designed reactor which is what we're talking about today. So how are harmonic filter ratings determined and more specifically uh, how is the harmonic filter reactor uh, uh, determined? So first of all we determine the reactive power requirements for the filter and we determine the harmonic current flow into the filter through harmonic analysis. So some type of load flow analysis is first completed 
maybe it's a power factor study, a load study, but we're determining how much reactive power we need. From there, we do a harmonic study. We want to install capacitors, but we determined that capacitors was a problem. So what did we do? We designed a harmonic filter, and based upon harmonic analysis, we've determined how much harmonic current will flow into that filter branch or filter bank. And then based upon that, we have LRC calculations. Last week we did a, and it was Tech Talk session nine, we did a discussion on, on designing uh, C high pass, high pass, and notch harmonic filters. We have a design spreadsheet on our website on how to do that. So if you want to know how to calculate L, which is the topic of today, that spreadsheet does it for you. And, uh, and then finally, after we're all said and done, we will talk about, well, how do you specify the harmonic filter reactor, which is the topic of today. So just quickly to uh, note here, these are the design equations for calculating uh, X of L. And again, shaded yellow is, a, is the topic of the day. How to calculate X of L, how to calculate inductance. Remember, inductance is 2 pi FL, right? So you have X of L equals 2 pi FL, 2 pi times the frequency, which is 50 or 60 hertz, and then times L. So it's a key, a key parameter for, for this inductor is inductive reactance and the inductance, which is usually measured in millihenries. So we, do, we go through a design uh, here for a 1,000 kV, 13.8 kV filter tuned to the 4.7th harmonic, and we can come up with a value of X of L and H, which are the two key parameters that determine um, the size of the reactor and, and the inductance of the reactor. And uh, remember that you can use this formula over here to calculate the voltage drop across a reactor. And what you will find that is approximately, approximately one uh, over the 20 point squared times the voltage line to neutral is equal to the voltage drop across the reactor. So on most systems here, there is not a whole lot of voltage uh, across the reactor. So we're going to talk about a concept of floating core design and how we can take advantage of that, uh, that design concept. Um, so uh, key design ratings, and this is in our, in, in our spreadsheet tool. And you can see here, these are the basic parameters that we use to specify uh, harmonic filter reactors. And so we're just going to kind of step through here. Remember, the harmonic analysis program determined, determined the amount of harmonic current that would flow through the reactor. And that's really a key rating to, our, to an iron core or air core harmonic filter tuning reactor is the current flow through there. What is the current flow through there? The reactor has to be able to thermally handle that, that current flow. But if it's a magnetic core, the, the magnetic flux within the core is also dependent upon current flow and the core size core rating must also be able to handle that. So knowing the uh, current flow is very important. It's what the output of the harmonic study is. But the output of the harmonic study should not necessarily determine the harmonic current rating that you specify. There should be a significant margin difference between those two. Um, so let's just step through the ratings here. You got number of phases. Of course, there's going to be a three phase uh, or a single phase reactor. Uh, again, we can use three-phase reactors or single-phase reactors, three single-phase reactors or one three-phase reactor. Uh, so you have to specify that uh, in the specification. We have an inductance and reactance, and normally we specify the inductive reactance at 60 hertz or at 50 hertz, whatever the, whatever the fundamental frequency of the system is. We have the nominal system voltage, and really that determines the BIL of the system and the withstand voltage of the system. Don't forget to take care of altitude. If there's altitude derating, it's important to think about that. There is an RMS current rating for the reactor, and uh, you can see here that we just take the sum of the square square root and we come up with a value of RMS current. Uh, this is an important design parameter. Uh, for air core reactors, it's sometimes often the only number that's used in, in the air core reactor design. For iron core reactors, you must specify the spectrum. You have to specify the spectrum uh, because Higher order harmonics create additional heating, and the reactor supplier needs to know what those harmonic currents are. Um, so harmonic current spectrum. Taps. Are there going to be taps? And we can have taps in the system uh, to adjust the tuning point. We can have taps in the system to do a minute adjustment for taking care of tolerance changes. Um, and we can also have what we call K-bar taps. We can have, say, a 1,000 K-bar tap and a 2,000 K-bar tap. So this is something that we can think about uh, doing or having taps. One key thing to remember is don't over specify the number of taps on a system. 
uh, a couple of taps, maybe two taps, no more than two taps, because each and every time you put taps into a reactor, uh, you have you have more overlap within the windings. It creates it creates a less reliable reactor. So minimize the number of taps that you use. Uh, ambient temperature. You have to specify what the ambient temperature is. Uh, last week we were talking about ambient temperature in metal closed cap banks and filter banks, and uh, we talked about the concept of specifying 60 C. It may be that outside of the enclosure is 40 C, but inside the enclosure is 60 C. We oftentimes see specifications written around a 40 C ambient, but if you are purchasing reactors or you are writing a specification that includes a reactor, the reactor spec, because the reactor sit in the side of the enclosure, it should be specified as 60 C, not as 40 C. To specify 40 C would be to create a less reliable system. And then Q rating. For, for iron core reactors, which we were talking about, um, you, you don't have a really a whole lot of flexibility in the Q rating of the reactor. And the Q rating is just the X over R. Uh, ratio of the reactor. A lot of times it's specified at the tuning frequency, but sometimes it might be 60 hertz. So iron core reactors, you are stuck with the Q rating that comes out from the design, basically based upon the resistance of the reactor uh, at its rating and in, in as rated temperature. For iron core reactors, we're seeing values typically in order about 100. For air core reactors, you're seeing values around 60. The air core guys do have a way of modifying the uh, Q factor of, of the of the reactor. So um, some recommendations. These are really key recommendations when specifying harmonic filter reactors. Um, be conservative in your design. Be conservative in your design. It's very, very important to be conservative uh, because a undersized reactor will be a reactor that runs hot. It will be one that runs loud and one that is susceptible to failure. Uh, the the, the um, the closer you are to the nominal rating of the reactor, the hotter it will be. So we have a design philosophy at NEPSI to over-specify. On the previous slide, I will show you, um, we showed design margin factors here, and you can see here we have a design margin factor 1.5. We're calculating the fundamental current of the reactor, we're multiplying by 1.5. What that means is that at the fundamental, we would only expect about 44% of the losses that the reactor was designed for. So this helps to ensure that we have reliability. Because the systems can change in time, okay, and because the calculations don't always work out the way they did, the study results sometimes can vary, uh, you want to have a filter and a filter reactor design that can accommodate these errors. So it's important. Uh, you will see in, in a little while the size of these reactors are enormous sometimes. The enclosures are designed around the reactors. If you had specified or underspecified a reactor, and then at a later date you say, well, I undersized the reactor, I need a larger reactor, well, sometimes that reactor will not fit inside the enclosure. So important to make sure that you, that you overspecify the reactor current ratings, both from a harmonic standpoint and also from the fundamental standpoint. It's going to improve reliability. And then also consider consider using only reputable manufacturers. NEPSI only uses two U.S. manufacturers and only one out of Europe. Uh, so we have spent a lot of time vetting the manufacturer. It should be a manufacturer who's very well aware of harmonic filter reactor design and has done it many, many times. It should be one of the uh, only places where they're doing work uh, is iron core filter design. Um, so. Uh, we're next going to talk about reactor types. There's two types, air core reactors and um, iron core reactors. And by and large, uh, metal closed systems use iron core reactors and open air systems use iron core react, I mean air core reactors. So in the yellow here on the right, you can see shaded in yellow are the air core reactors. Um, they're extended up at um, up on pedestals. This is a North American requirement uh, because we can't have people who can walk into the substation and touch live parts. So this is a open air harmonic filter system. The reactors are exposed and they're called air core reactors. We will talk about that in a minute. On the left here, iron core reactors are used in a metal closed system primarily because we cannot have stray uh, magnetic fields 
um, that would emanate from the reactors. Air core reactors have an external magnetic field that's allowed to flow at a pretty good distance from the air core reactor. Iron core reactors, the, the magnetic field is held within the iron itself and therefore it can't escape. If we were to try to put an air core reactor into this enclosure, the magnetic field would couple with the enclosure and the enclosure would potentially get red hot. So it's important to never use air core reactors inside a metal closed system. And generally speaking, you cannot use iron core reactors with an open air system because these are not designed for outdoor use. They must be inside an enclosure. So let's go through iron core reactors and air core reactors for a moment. Uh, the key difference here between air core and iron core is there's a iron core. Okay, so the magnetic field is constrained within the iron core here. We got a set of windings wrapped around the core. Basically it looks like a transformer winding. You can see it here. Dog bones with, are put in there are spacers. The spacers are designed to allow for airflow through the coils of the um, reactor to keep it cool. Um, heat will be generated by the winding, I squared R losses within the winding, but there are also eddy current losses inside the iron that also need to be evacuated. We need to vent the core area uh, also to keep it cool. And this is a gapped core design. The, the actual uh, iron does not complete a full loop, we, but we have gaps, what are called air gaps. It's the air gaps that create the inductance in the iron core design. And because the iron, in a sense, focuses the uh, magnetic flux and it can, can magnify the inductance effect. And that's kind of what you see here. You have a gapped core design. You want to use many gaps. Many gaps is preferable because the smaller the gap, the less fringing flux we have here, and then the less heating effect we have here. So flux that enters the core at a horizontal direction here causes heating or additional heating within the core and uh, therefore uh, it's desirable to use many small gaps. But you need to have enough gaps to create the inductance and this is part of a calculation procedure that the reactor suppliers use. The single phase reactors are put up on insulators and we tack the winding to the core and in so doing the whole core and supporting structure are elevated in voltage. We do that because the voltage drop across a filter reactor generally speaking is one over the end uh, one over n squared times the line to neutral voltage. More specifically, n squared over n squared minus one, but uh, it comes out to be about that value. The air core reactor has a lot of similarities to iron core reactors. The first one is that the air core winding, the winding is spun around a spindle. So um, I, I like to compare the spindle to the iron. In this case, the iron supports the, supports the winding uh, for an air core reactor the spindle supports the winding. The difference is that we removed the iron. Uh, so it takes a lot more uh, of a radius here and a lot more of air. The, the flux must travel much further to create the inductance. Uh, so generally speaking, air core reactors get very large. We also support the air core reactors on insulators. Same concept is being used in both places. Uh, so there are a lot of similarities between iron core and air core. Really, the only difference is the, the iron itself is the key difference. So there are advantages and disadvantages. And um, the iron core reactor, no straight magnetic fields. It's, it's within the iron itself. Uh, so we don't have to be concerned about a magnetic field. Air core reactors, the straight magnetic field is an issue. Okay, if you have a, a pacemaker, for instance, that uh, magnetic field is going to be quite strong. can give you a heart attack. If you have any steel objects within a certain distance of, of the reactor, it's going to cause heating. It can get red hot. We've come across projects where um, the, the capacitor rack is located too close to, to, the, um, to the reactor and the entire capacitor rack is heating up. So it's very important to keep the distance. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, typically speaking, uh, iron core reactors have short lead times in the order of six to eight weeks where, iron, where uh, air core reactors were at a much longer lead time. We have seen lead times up to 26 weeks. Um, we have a lower cost uh, with iron core reactors, lower losses. The losses of an iron core reactor are based upon the I squared R or X over R ratio of the reactor. X over R ratio for iron core is about 100 and for air core we're typically looking at X over R of about 60. So I squared R um, would be 
would be greater in an air core reactor. So this is a common misconception. Um, one of the major disadvantages of iron core reactors is that they're susceptible to saturation. So, and this goes back to, it goes back to doing a conservative rating on the iron core reactor. If you have a, an iron core reactor, the, the, the uh, saturation characteristics of the core, the size of the core, so the, the, the larger the core, the more flux it can handle, um, is based upon the amount of current that flows through that reactor. So if you have underspecified the, um, if you have underspecified the reactor currents, the reactor supplier will create a smaller core. And uh, once you put that piece of equipment in operation, if the core can't support the magnetic flux, it saturates. Saturation results in a loud reactor, more vibration, and more heating. So I can't overstress the fact that you want to put in a significant amount of design margins in, in your iron core reactors. This is how you eliminate the, 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 the possibility of failure. Air core reactors is more forgiving. The, the concern here is more just the RMS current. You don't have a saturation concern because you got all the air in the world to conduct that magnetic field. So this is a picture of an iron core reactor. I'm going to bring you out back in just a moment, so I'm not going to um, get into this too much. Uh, you can have different insulation classes. We have two that we've designed for class H and class B, 220C insulation using like a Nomex. You can see here 60C ambient, always specifying 60C ambient, but the temperature rise, the allowed temperature rise um, is based upon the insulation class. Windings are copper or aluminum. We always suggest leave this up to the reactor supplier. They know best. They know the economies of scale. They understand what materials to use, what's best for the project. And uh, always specify VPI, uh, VPI, uh, vacuum pressure impregnation on the reactor itself. So uh, single phase design, we talked about this already. Uh, there are a possibility of three-phase reactors. So we can use single-phase reactors in a three-phase network, three single-phase reactors to develop that harmonic filter, uh, but we can also have three, uh, a three-phase reactor. Generally speaking, um, these are only available up to about two megavars at 13.8 kV. Maybe it's pushing it to get to three megavars, but the reactors themselves become quite big and um, the, 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 the um, limitation oftentimes is the reactor supplier and the size of their VPI system. They're dipping it into a tank, they're putting varnish on the reactor, how big is that tank? So these reactors can get quite complicated and quite big. Uh, they, we're using, uh, there's three windings um, on, on, the, um, on a three-phase reactor, and that's what you see here. Uh, so we have three gapped legs to create the, the um, the inductor. And this becomes complicated because when they're clamping here, uh, to get an even clamping force on all three legs become, becomes difficult. So we often find, find that these reactors, one of the disadvantages are, is that they're noisy. They're noisy because they're hard to clamp. Uh, so um, the other thing is to recognize is that three-phase reactors are mounted at ground potential. We're not raising the reactor up and uh, onto insulators. We can't do that because we have a common leg on the three-phase windings. Uh, so we must insulate the winding to the core at full voltage. So at 13.8 kV, we'd be looking at 7960 volts across the, the winding to the core. And this, is, uh, this is a, has an effect of really decreasing the reliability of the reactor because now, uh, we're relying upon the reactor supplier to, to insulate the reactor windings from the core and to do that properly. And there's a lot of voltage stress there. We can have tracking and things like that that can occur. So uh, we generally will only supply um, a three-phase reactor up to 125 kV BIL. And uh, even mo most often, we're even typically at only going up to 95 kV BIL. Uh, so, um, in that case, it, once we get above 95 or 125, we'll go to uh, a single phase design. And also when we get up above the two megavar range. So th this is um, just a diagram of a typical, uh, typical voltage stress diagram on a floating core design. And again, what we're trying to show here is that, um, is that the voltage across the winding is one over N 
one over, basically one over n squared times the line to neutral voltage. So most of the voltage stress on like a 38 kV design, uh, say it was 200 kV BIL, would be across the de insulator. We would have a lot less voltage stress here across the winding itself. So uh, we were able to create a more reliable design by using a floating core type design. And this is really the, the configuration and we're, we're distributing, showing you the distribution of voltage across the, air, the actual filter itself. So air core, just to talk a little bit about air core reactors. Um, the picture on the left here shows a stacked, uh, a stacked three phase reactor. Um, this is a high pass filter. You can see there's a capacitor rack, reactors here, three phases, and then the resistor cage here. Um, the reactors in North America must be mounted on an elevating structure like this, okay, because uh, we're, we're using basically nine foot six inches, about three meters of height must be required. So if a person stands on a slab, they can't touch live parts up there. Um, this is relatively close. I kind of note this picture here that's relatively close, and I wonder if this customer have had problems with heating effects on the resistor cage here. Uh, the picture on the right shows reactors mounted at ground potential, and um, th this picture is actually from South America where, where they mounted those reactors uh, at ground potential. So it's an unstacked arrangement. Uh, we talked about uh, the magnetic fields. When you, when you install air core reactors, there are magnetic field clearance lines. You're going to see this concept of MC1 and MC2. So MC2 is 1.5 times the coil diameter here. So if you think about the area, a reactor, an air core reactor could be uh, anywhere between, uh, say, uh, 10 feet in diameter. So we could have a very significant distance here, up to maybe 20 feet uh, and many, many feet across here. Uh, so um, magnetic field clearance is a critical item. And uh, there's also magnetic field clearance requirements also in the axle direction, up and down. Uh, so for those ground-mounted ground -mounted air core reactors, you, you must make sure uh, that the rebar and the concrete uh, is properly laid so that you don't have, a, um, magnetic, you don't have a heating within the, the rebar that's in the concrete. So um, harmonic filter tuning reactors, um, the uh, standards. Uh, so I've listed all the standards here that apply. Uh, this note down here on the lower right is key. There are no real electrical standards um, that apply to iron core reactors. So typically we go to various standards, and I've listed those standards up here to develop our test protocol uh, for, for the reactors. All right, so um, I'm going to ask a, a question, and I'm going to run out to the shop. I want you guys to ponder the question. Uh, so. Often, especially on projects developed outside North America, NEPSI will be requested to supply a capacitor bank with a reactor that is 6% rated, sometimes 5% rated or 7% rated, but they'll use this, this percent rated concept. What does that mean and uh, what tuning point does a capacitor bank equipped with a 6% reactor equate to? So think about that. I will be back with you out in the shop in just one minute. We'll get an answer to that question. Okay, guys. Uh, so, okay, so for a 6% uh, reactor, the tuning point can be calculated with the following equation. Tuning point equals the square root of 100 divided by the reactor percent. So, the answer to your question, or to this question, is 4.08 harmonic. So, the question is, well, what is 6%? And 6% represents 6% um, uh, of the capacitive reactance will equal the inductive reactance, okay, and that's what that means. So we know uh, what the inductive reactance is, and you could then calculate the tuning point. Um, so it's also about equal to what the voltage drop will be across that reactor, line to neutral, 6%, uh, but not exactly. Uh, remember, it's n squared over n squared minus 1. 
Okay, guys. So I'm in the shop here, and behind me are three very large harmonic filter reactors, blue ones. These happen to be from Germany, a company called Mangold, HVM, Hans von Mangold, great company. Over here is a smaller iron core harmonic filter reactor by a company named Control Transformer. So we routinely use three different suppliers, two in the US, one in Europe and Germany. Uh, pick your reactor supplier wisely. This is very complex electromechanical device. Um, so think about that. We're gonna walk through some of the key elements of the iron core reactor. These are single phase reactors. You can note that there's a set of terminals uh, on the top here. You have an incoming terminal and an outgoing terminal. So we're going to talk electrically about what goes on with the system. Incoming, outgoing terminal, and you have a copper bar here. So this is an iron core reactor, and you've got the perimeter of the reactor here. And that's the iron. This is iron. It's built up of, lam of iron laminations. It conducts the magnetic field around this um, device. Um, so we, we are connecting electrically here. You got this copper bar here, which is connecting the windings, winding one and winding two. These windings can be either in parallel or in series, okay, to create the inductance of this, of this reactor. So this reactor, just to kind of give you some feelings about ratings and weight, this reactor right here um, is a, is a 4.7 tune reactor. It's going into a 3.6 megavar, 50 hertz harmonic filter system. So 3.6 megavars, 34.5 kV, 50 hertz, and it's going in as a 4.7th tuned filter. Here, um, it's actually, I make a mistake. This is the largest of the reactors, 14.4 megavars, 4.7th tuned, and uh, it weighs 2,700 kilograms. It's got 10.6 kilowatts of losses, so a significant amount of losses. When you think about losses, don't forget that the losses include the fundamental losses plus the harmonic losses, and uh, they are at the rating of the reactor. So 2,700 kilograms, about 6,000 pounds, is for a 14.4 megavar, 4.7 tune, 34.5 kV um, harmonic filter. This one is about half the size in terms of megavar rating. So this is going on a 7.2 megavar system 4.7 tuned and this is second stage of our system and then finally 3.6 megavars here and uh, this one is 2,000 pounds so we go from 2,000 pounds up to 6,000 pounds here and um, it's about four times this one is about four times the megavar rating that, oh, than when compared to this one so the reactors are supported on insulators you can see here the way they're shipped the reactors are supported on insulators. This reactor will be lifted up and put on, put on these support insulators here. The, um, there are vibration mounts underneath. This is something that Mango does different than other suppliers. They use vibration mounts, okay? And they go up on to, um, onto these insulators. So most of the voltage is dropped across, across, this, across this insulator here. If you think about the, the um, the, the voltage profile we talked about already, the uh, fifth tune reactor, about 1 25th of the voltage is dropped across the coil. The remaining voltage, 24 over 25, is dropped across here. So maybe just six, seven, 800 volts dropped across the coil. The remaining voltage is dropped across the insulator. Okay, the, the, the winding is attached to the core here. Okay, so this, this entire reactor is lifted in voltage up to line voltage. So it's basically sitting at about 19.9 kV on a 34.5 kV system. It's floating in that place. And we have a plus voltage and minus voltage centered about this tap point here. So overall, having a floating core design creates a significant amount of reliability because the voltage stress is across something we can see. The voltage stress is not across the insulation of the system. If this were a grounded core, we would be worried about the, the isolation of the winding to the core, the insulation of the winding to core. We'd be developing that with, with some type of insulation paper, and that's a complex issue. So by doing this, we improve the reliability of the reactor. You can see that the reactors are, are lifted from the top, or they can be lifted from the bottom with a forklift. The, the, um, the core is a laminated design. If I step aside here, maybe we go to this one over here, Matt. 
if you look at this, you can see we have laminations. There, there's different grades of laminations in an iron core reactor. You have like M2, M3, M4, M5. The, the smaller the lamination, the more expensive the reactor, the lower the losses, the less the eddy currents losses within the reactor. So it's a pretty complex uh, issue right here alone. All reactors are not created equal. They may look the same, but they're not created the same. You can also look here, these lines. These represent gaps. They represent gaps. Remember, um, if you go back to your, high, your, your engineering uh, 101 days, um, the inductance L equals N squared P, N squared times the permeance of this core, okay, which is equal to L phi, which is basically one of the reluctance is L phi over mu naught A. So the gap is, the gaps of these is what's creating the inductance. So more gap, more inductance. Right, more gap length, more inductance. They distribute the gap all the way down through the leg, so it's very complex. There are a lot of forces, tangential and, comp and vertical forces in the reactor when it's actually in operation. So the clamping of this is a very complex matter, and that's why we say you have to leave it to people who have this expertise. Um, the, the, the length of the air gap also makes a difference. So you cannot put all the air gap in one location. It has to be uh, gaps distributed like this. And this is what makes this more complex, is that, is that we're distributing the gap. And by doing that, we get rid of what's called flux fringing, flux fringing at the gap. When we have fringing flux, if this, as you open the gap up, we'll get a tangential and vertical component of flux, and that causes heating in the lamination the tangential component. You want all the flux to be uniform straight through. When it's not because you created too large of a gap, we get, we get a cross flux against the grain of the iron, and that causes a lot of losses inside a reactor. So we look to have a lot of gaps, and this in particular is an amazing number of gaps uh, in there. Maybe you can perhaps see it. So we will uh, also talk electrically about what's going on. Remember, the winding is energized relative to the core. There is a differential voltage between these two. Uh, so there is insulation buildup here that uh, needs to be developed so that uh, the winding does not short to the core. There's a voltage difference there. So that's something else that is with the reactor supplier. And then finally, we want, want to also talk about the heat. There's a lot of heat buildup within the core itself. And in this particular instance, they, cre they create a lot of distance between, um, between the reactor core and the winding to allow air to flow up through. So it's a great design for releasing heat within the, within the reactor. So let me just take a look at this one. That, uh, you can note that the terminals come out the winding on this one. Uh, this one appears to be a foil winding, although I don't know for sure. And this one here, you can see that the terminals come out and they, they post up on insulators. I also like this design concept by Control Transformer in that they bring the windings up onto a set of insulators which are supported off the core. Um, you can't see the, 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 the uh, neutral bar, well, the neutral bar here is on top and it's tacked to the core. So you can maybe come around here, Matt, and just show this real quick. Okay, we're tacking the winding to the core at the center point again. So we get some advantage of doing that. But again, we have laminations, and it's a gapped core design. And here we are also looking to support the um, reactor up on insulators. Almost all reactors are supported on insulators. That's our standard design concept. Okay, so I'm going to leave you now uh, with some rules of thumbs as I run back to the office. I'll be back in about a minute. All right, okay, back. Okay, so rules of thumbs, do's and don'ts. You've had some time to go through. Um, so the do's, uh, for metal and closed capacitor banks, 60C ambient, uh, specify fundamental current rating of, of 150%, specify inductance linearity to 250%. Linear is important because as the uh, harmonic current goes up and we have peaks, we want to make sure that the inductance remains linear through that, uh, through that whole range. Uh, Overspecify harmonic current. Just don't go by what's on 
uh, what the harmonic study puts out, over-specify the harmonic currents. We like to say a 50% rated reactor or a 100% rated reactor, which means that 50% rated means we're going 50% of the fundamental will be like a fifth harmonic, and, uh, or we have a 100% rated reactor. In a very difficult mine application, we would be at 100%. Uh, general industrial, 50%. So uh, this is a concept. Even if my harmonic study came up with three or four percent harmonic current, we would still be at 50 percent. It helps to guarantee the reliability of the equipment. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so specify that the um, that the iron core flux density must assume all harmonic currents are in phase, and what that means is that the you're not using an RMS value to calculate the flux density in the core. You're actually assuming that the harmonic currents are all in phase and that we actually get the true peak current that might uh, potentially exist. If you do that, uh, it will help to guarantee that you don't have saturation in the reactor ever. Um, and then specify testing. Specify um, testing on all uh, for all critical process type projects, uh, heat run, linearity, partial discharge, in post. Um, these are tests that you should specify. It helps to guarantee the reactor. Remember, reactors are custom designed. So like any other custom designed piece of equipment, anything that's new, it should be type tested. So they are, are tests that you should be looking to, to confirm that are done. Um, so the dotes, now we're at the dotes here. And um, don't underspecify the, um, the harmonic current. Don't want to specify the harmonic current. It goes to that 1.5 factor. Um, don't specify thermistors. There's oftentimes at meeting voltage, people want to drop thermistors into the reactor. They want to measure the temperature. Remember, the core is floating. You don't want medium voltage next to low voltage control components. To put that thermistor in there is to put a low voltage control device into a reactor winding, which is sitting at 15 kV or 38 kV, a dangerous proposition to do that. Uh, so we highly recommend stay away from thermistors because you're bringing medium voltage uh, to the control panel where somebody might be sitting. And you're relying upon a reactor manufacturer to wrap that that, that thermistor with insulation and dip it down. Who's to say that over time it doesn't degrade, that the heat of the reactor doesn't degrade it? So we highly recommend stay away from thermistors. Specify, um, don't specify 40C, specify 60C. And uh, don't buy solely on price. And uh, when you look at uh, reactors, when, you, when you're looking at uh, suppliers, of metal closed capacitor banks or open air systems, um, you want to not buy solely on price because a lot of times um, the reactor is where people are cutting corners. Uh, and then consider the experience of your reactor supplier. Uh, how much experience do they have? Are they a regular supplier of harmonic filter reactors? So know who you're buying from. Um, so we're gonna do some common myths. Um, we're gonna debunk those common myths. Uh, and this is especially when it comes to iron core, iron core reactors. Uh, so the first myth, iron core reactors are less reliable than air core reactors. And uh, this, is, this has come about and is really a, an old concern, but there are a lot of engineers out there that might still remember um, back in the 90s when, there, when iron core reactors were just starting to get developed. In the early 90s, there was a lot of iron core reactor failures. And it's because the iron core reactor manufacturers just weren't up to speed yet on, on, on the design concepts. And it's also because the, the, the people doing the studies and we were specifying the harmonic filters, we're not adding the margin that we talk about uh, in, in these designs. Uh, so if you, if you design reactors with the margins that we talked about, 250% saturation, uh, you uh, use 150% fundamental current rating, Using the 60C ambient, uh, you can you can almost rest assured that you will not have a saturation or an overheating concern. I kind of go through an example here. If I have a reactor operating at 100% fundamental voltage or fundamental current, I'm sorry, but having a fundamental current rating of 150%, um, they will have a, a current loss value of 44%. So we're only going to see 44% of the losses that that reactor was designed for. So it's significantly running at an under, uh, volt, uh, under um, heat loss requirements. Uh, so we designed our enclosure to accept all the heat at 150% current. 
and uh, yet we're only running at 44 percent. So we're 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 getting rid of these concerns. They certainly don't exist in our designs. And then iron core reactors have higher losses than air core reactors. And this is because uh, this concept or this myth comes about because when you shut off a harmonic filter bank, oftentimes you touch the reactor and it will be hot. And it's because the heat is more centralized into the core area of the reactor. Uh, an air core reactor, the, the, the volume is, is quite significant. Again, three meters across, or 10 feet in diameter. So it's quite large. So the reactor itself will, will have that feeling of heat that an iron core reactor is because it's so compact. Uh, so you can just do some simple calculations based upon X over R ratio of 60 and 100, which are the typical X over R ratios for air core and iron core reactors. And you can easily see uh, from the I squared R value that um, because uh, X over R 100 for iron core reactors, the losses will be less. Uh, so less losses. Uh, so for some additional information, we wrote um, a great article a while back with this great with this great picture. Matt Marset did the picture, a really cool picture. We actually owe a couple more follow-ups to this article, which we haven't completed, but it's a great place to go get some additional information about iron core versus air core reactors. So uh, consider going to, to my LinkedIn page and you'll find, find that information. So uh, don't forget our website has a significant amount of information on it. You can go there. Um, for all kinds of information, uh, videos, um, specifications, uh, how-to videos, spreadsheet tools, calculator tools, and so on. A significant amount of information. Don't forget to early engage with NEPSI. This is important. Uh, if you early engage with us, we can walk you through the process of harmonic filter design, how to specify the reactors. This is uh, how we go to market. And uh, for PDH credits, don't forget uh, we're going with this code of 711 today. Please, if you could, uh, send us an email on Friday, and we'll get those issued to you. So in conclusion, um, we reviewed the iron core reactors. We talked about um, how to overspecify the reactors. If you overspecify it, you're going to reduce um, the effects, the, the heating effects, the noise. You're going to improve reliability, and uh, you're going to decrease the possibility of failure. Uh, iron core reactors are very complex. Uh, electromechanical and uh, it should be electromechanical and magnetic devices is very complex there are a lot of moving parts um, the iron core reactor is not simple uh, the design is complex so make sure that you use the right suppliers uh, and make sure that you over specify those okay guys all right so um, next week um, uh, during next week's session, we will be um, we will be talking about harmonic filter bank protection. Uh, so we're going to be doing overcurrent protection, over voltage protection, overload protection, over temperature, VTHD, ITHD, over temperature, um, uh, blown fuse detection. We're going to discuss how NEPSI uh, approaches protection of harmonic filters and uh, how we would recommend it be done. Uh, so we are now uh, ready to go with questions. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, click over to the um, question screen. If you would, um, just please present all your questions and we'll get back to you.